What's going on everybody? Welcome to the reveal of number 24 in my power rankings, a deep dive into Da Bears. And this is going to be a fun one because this is a team with a ton of hype going into this season. You'd be hard pressed to find a 2018 breakout teams wildcard sleepers article online without reading about this Bears team. So I'm trying to not get rhetorical here, but there is a lot to talk about. Now, the one thing I will say, and we are going to get into the schedule and what I'm expecting for this team at the very end of this video, but let's not forget that the NFC is a total gauntlet. And even though I like what this team has done, and I think that while other teams might be improving more just by returning stars, you think of Green Bay, Houston, Indianapolis, I don't think there's a team that overhauled their roster and improved their team on paper more than the Bears did this offseason. And obviously a big role, a pivotal point here for how good this team can be and if they can get into the playoffs is going to come down to this quarterback position. So let's get right into our positional grades here, starting with the quarterback, Mitch Trubisky. And everything is in place now for Mitch to succeed after last year was basically a redshirt season. He played a little over half the year, but this team kind of knew they weren't making the playoffs. He didn't have a lot of help. They did what they could to kind of get him comfortable, but not ask too much and ruin his confidence by having asking too much and having a bunch of mistakes on his hands. So this year is going to be super key. Not just because if he takes a huge jump, this team coming in at 24 in the power rankings, you know, if that quarterback ranking where it's 19th right now, which is definitely projecting some optimism here for Mitch Trubisky for next season, if all of a sudden he takes a huge jump, this team gets top 10 quarterback play, this offense becomes a really good offense, and then this team probably escalates in my ratings to that 12 to 16 range where we're really talking about a serious playoff contender. So while it's pivotal for this season, for that reason, it's also pivotal for the future because I always talk about the significance of having an elite quarterback, not just a franchise quarterback. This is the year, no excuses. We get to find out if Mitch Trubisky is going to be Ryan Tannehill or if he could be Andrew Luck. And I've already talked about my five elite quarterback traits. I won't get too far in depth here. You can go back to my Jets deep dive to see me really break down my five traits. But basically, these are the things that the best quarterbacks, the elite quarterbacks can do to transcend scheme. Traits that these guys have consistently that they use when the play call isn't good, when the defense takes away your reads which becomes more important in the playoffs as defenses are better coached and tend to have more talent. This is why we see these elite quarterbacks, more or less the same four or five guys in conference championships year after year. So bring it back to Mitch Trubisky. My first trait is the C ball, hit ball arm. To have the natural arm talent, but also the instincts to drive the ball where it needs to go, particularly downfield and when you're on the move off balance, this is something that really helps quarterbacks on the back end of plays when things kind of start to go to hell, whether you're in the pocket or out. Number two is the ability to throw guys open when the scheme doesn't have receivers open, you are able to throw guys open. So I'm not talking about completion percentage accuracy. I'm talking about elite level. How did this guy make that throw type of throws? Uh, and Trubisky definitely has the possibility to do that consistently. Just not enough tape to say yes or no at this point. Then traits three and four. This is definitely where Trubisky falls in even a little lower for me than like a Sam Darnold, believe it or not. And number three is pre-snap play recognition. Number four is post-snap recognition. So the post-snap thing specifically with Mitch is my concern. So this is adjusting to disguised looks. This is not forcing stupid mistakes, extending the play with your mind and understanding what one thing a defense is doing opens up for another to not take the check down because that's what your read says. You know, like I talk about with Derek Carr, way too many quarterbacks say, this is the right read, I'll hit the check down, but it's third and nine and you end up with a four yard completion and punt. What makes Tom Brady so great is he has the patience to let the play develop, look guys off with his eyes and understand what he can do. So this is kind of the mental side of creating big plays. And then number five is more of the physical mobile side, sensing pressure, knowing when to step up, knowing when to get out of the pocket, keeping your eyes downfield as you're moving 
And Mitch Trubisky definitely has this. I think he could obviously continue to get better at extending the plays with his feet, but he's already in the top half of starting quarterbacks at doing this. And as far as that first trade is concerned, he absolutely has that sea ball hit ball arm. I think this is his best trait. I don't love to bring in Madden ratings to this, but I think it's relevant here. You know, Mitch Trubisky probably is a top 10 throw on the run type of quarterback here. Really accurate on the move. So he's already got some great traits. The mental side is the question mark and the reason he's not a top 18 quarterback right now. You know, he's tied with three other guys for 19, but obviously has a ton of potential. And this is the year that we get to frame those expectations for him. Is he Ryan Tannehill or could he be Andrew Luck? And that's what makes this year so exciting for the Bears, especially with this surrounding core that should enable him to do that or at least give him a really good chance to do it. So let's move on here. Let's talk about these running backs. You got Jordan Howard and Tariq Cohen. The combination of these two comes in 15th in the league. So just a really solid group. Really not too much to say here. You know, Jordan Howard, kind of the big smooth. I know that was Arian Foster's nickname, but really good vision, zone runner, terrible hands though. And that's what makes Tariq Cohen so interesting especially when you look at the Chiefs offense of the past. Of course, you've got the new coach here coming over, Matt Nagy. You can really go back to Jamal Charles. Then you got Charkandrick West, Spencer Ware, of course, Kareem Hunt last season. And then the Eagles influence. We saw Corey Clement really take a big role because Jay Ajayi and LeGarrette Blunt aren't special as receivers. That's exactly what I think is going to happen with Tariq Cohen who is definitely talent-wise a top seven receiving back in the league. And he also has enough between the tackles to at least make you respect him. He's not a great between the tackles runner, but he can do it. So I think we're going to start to see more and more Tariq Cohen. You know, from a fantasy perspective, I definitely like Cohen. Uh, I'm not entirely sure where he's going, but I think he's going to catch a ton of balls here. And he has big play potential as well. As far as Howard is concerned, he should have a good year, but he's probably going to be taken off the field a little more in this new offense just because he doesn't catch the ball well at all. He just might be the worst receiving running back among starting running backs in the NFL right now. you got Taquan Mazzell, Benny Cunningham, then Ryan Nall, a guy to keep an eye on here if he makes this team, whether he's a fullback or a running back. Hate to use the white running back cliche, but he definitely showed some shiftiness and some power at Oregon State, a little under the radar guy. Compare him to Rex Burkhead. Yeah, I know. That's actually a pretty damn good comparison for how he plays. So then moving on to the receiving core here. Awesome, awesome receiving core. What might have been the worst in the NFL last year jumps all the way up for me. Wait for it. Tied for sixth. So you bring in Allen Robinson. I think very highly of him. He basically just needs to resume what he was two years ago. And he's going to be in that discussion because right now I think there are five tier one wide receivers. I think Allen Robinson in 2015, you could make an easy argument for him to be the sixth in that tier one. So right now he's in tier two, but if we're four weeks into the season and he looks like he did in 2015, clicking with Mitch Trubisky, he's going to be in that tier one of top echelon receivers. Really love Allen Robinson, super quick feet for his size, great hands, great route runner, good worker, all of it. But it's not just him, but that is a lot of it. They bring in Taylor Gabriel. They're gonna be able to do a lot of fun things with him. You know, that Kansas City offense is about as close to a trick play offense at times as you can see. So they're gonna get creative with Taylor Gabriel. I don't know if he makes a huge impact as an actual receiver. And the main reason I say that is they drafted Anthony Miller, who was my number two receiver in this class, probably my favorite receiver in this class. I hesitantly compare him to Antonio Brown. Super good route runner, tough, great hands. He's gonna plug right into the slot here and be a great playmaker for Mitch Trubisky and this offense. So I think very highly of Anthony Miller and it's an excellent fit. So Dynasty Leagues, I would love to get my hands on him. He just might be my number one dynasty target for receivers ahead of guys like Calvin Ridley and DJ Moore. So you really got three interesting receivers there. And then on top of that all, they bring in Trey Burton. He's going to play a lot of receiver, slot receiver, definitely more of a receiver than a traditional tight end. And then they also got Adam Shaheen and Deion Sims here. So they got a pretty deep group of tight ends. 
Anything you get from Kevin White is going to be house money, but he still has a ton of upside. Uh, but he doesn't even factor into this receiver grade. I'm just assuming that he's going to get hurt and miss the season again. But I guess you don't know. And then they grab Javon Wims in the seventh round, who I had a third to fourth round grade on. Underutilized guy at Georgia. Really good athlete. Big bodied guy. If he gets an opportunity, I think he could make a name for himself. So I love this receiving core. Everyone kind of compliments each other. Everyone they brought in, it made a ton of sense. Really excited to see this group grow. Again, I've got them tied for sixth in the league. And then this offensive line is certainly not bad as they come in tied for 12th for me. Left tackle to right guard, you're really solid. Charles Leno, they just paid a good chunk of money. And then left guard, it's either going to be Whitehair or James Daniels. Conflicting reports on who's actually going to play at left guard. But regardless, you've got a really good young duo of a left guard and a center. Really loved that James Daniels pick. Great value in the second round out of Iowa. One of the more athletic linemen you're going to find. And then Kyle Long has to stay healthy. But when healthy, he's one of the best six or seven guards in the league that people just forget about because this Bears team has been pretty quiet lately. So if healthy, left tackle or right guard, that is a super group. And then right tackle... It's been Bobby Massey there. He's been kind of the weakest chain, and he's just kind of existed. Jordan Morgan was a fifth-round pick last year. It's going to be a competition there at right tackle. Whoever wins, you're probably not getting much more than average play at right tackle. But across the board, pretty good line. It's decently thin. You do have Eric Cush backing up on the inside, former hard knock star. But really across the board, exciting-looking offense everything's in place and it's going to hinge on Mitch Trubisky. But the main reason, as you can tell, I'm pretty high on what this offense is going to offer for this team. The main reason this team does come in at 24th, which is definitely not a bad outlook for them, but the reason they're not a top 20 team is this defense. And I like a lot of the things they did, but they have some pretty big holes here. Primarily edge rush, which has a very heavy weight in my power rankings. So I do sort the front seven by run defense, linebacker, and pass rush. Let's get out of the way and talk about the pass rush. Spoiler alert, it's not good. Leonard Floyd is the number one guy here. Has the upside to be a true number one edge rusher, but hasn't developed a ton since he came into the league. Dude's got to stay healthy and develop. And maybe with some good pieces around here, this is going to be the year where he takes a big step up. He's not a bad pass rusher, but for him to be the standalone best edge rusher here, it's not good because you got Aaron Lynch, who disappeared from San Francisco, had a really good rookie year, and then just has been nowhere to be found. And then Sam Acho and Jonathan Anderson, who's actually kind of like a hybrid. They draft Kylie Fitz, and then that's really it. So it's a super bad group of edge rushers. They come in 31st, and while I like what a lot of the other things are, are doing here on this defense... When you're not getting after the quarterback, it can be super difficult to play consistent defense. And the run defense here, not terrible. Should actually be improved and pretty good this year. They do come in 23rd, but honestly, the run defense grades here, you can see it doesn't have a huge weight in my power rankings. The difference between number one and 32 for run defense in this league is actually pretty slim when you look at the numbers. Playing run defense seems to be more of a week to week thing if you really dive into the analytics. But anyway, they've got a good D-line, a really good D-line actually, between Eddie Goldman and Akeem Hicks, who finally started to get that superstar recognition after uh, the better part of two years now has been one of the best interior defensive linemen. I've been hyping him up on this channel, so I'm glad to see him finally get the respect he deserves. So you got Eddie Goldman, good nose tackle, not necessarily an impact player, but is gonna contribute in the run defense. Uh, then you got a collection of rotational guys, Jonathan Bullard, Robertson Harris, John Jenkins, Rashad Coward, terrible name for a defensive lineman. And then they draft Bilal Nichols, a huge project but freak athlete guy out of Delaware. So pretty average D line pumped up by superstar Keem Hicks. But then you look at this linebacking group who wasn't terrible to begin with. And then you spark it with Roquan Smith, who was one of my three or four favorite players in this entire class. I mean, you get an instant impact in terms of leadership and range in the middle of that defense. So, you know, I'm keeping the run defense great up here just to kind of talk about how these linebackers will contribute in run defense, Danny Trevathan and Roquan Smith. But what these guys are going to do, and I really like what this Bears team is doing by getting modern here, some of the best defenses, Jacksonville, Minnesota, Philadelphia, they've realized that having that big 
thumping linebacker in the modern NFL, whether you're a 3-4 team or a 4-3 team, it simply doesn't matter as much in today's NFL where teams are passing on first down more than ever before and coming out with three wide receivers on first down more than ever. So where I show this linebacker grade, I'm really looking at how good can these guys cover. And Roquan Smith is going to plug in and be right there with Deion Jones immediately as an elite cover linebacker. I have no doubt about it. He did it in college. There's no reason to think he couldn't do it at the next level. So I thought he was actually a value where the Bears take him. I think we're I talked about this in my draft videos where with this kind of changing of the guard and style of play like I just talked about, those cover linebackers are becoming more and more valuable. So I don't think it's going to take long at all for us to say that Roquan Smith is a surefire top five elite linebacker in this league. I'm talking like four or five weeks into the season. Bam, we know it. Dude's great. Danny Trevathan can cover. Not an uber athlete, but really instinctive. And then if you want that bigger thumper guy, you got Nick Kwiatkowski here, who's really not terrible. Then they draft Joel Egan Booney Way in the fourth round to add even more athleticism to this group of linebackers. Now they've actually got him listed as an edge rusher and that's a little bit more like he played in college, but very much undersized to do that at the NFL level. So I see him transitioning to a off ball linebacker. So outside of edge rush, you got a good front seven here. And then these defensive backs, I've got him tied with four other teams for 22nd. I like Kyle Fuller. He finally stayed healthy last year and emerged as a number one corner. And then you've got some guys who have established their role on this team. Prince of Mukamara, say what you want, he's bounced around, but he's not a liability at corner, although he's not really a playmaker. And then Bryce Callahan, very underrated slot corner. You can question how he is in coverage, and that's obviously more important than run defense, but he is very, very physical and can be a guy who can force turnovers out of the nickel. So you've got three pretty good guys there at corner. And then two really young safeties who showed a lot of nice things last year, Adrian Amos, who's really emerging as one of the five or six best safeties in the league. Kind of a do-it-all guy. Reminds me a lot of HaHa ha Clinton Dix, actually. And then Eddie Jackson, who really just had two weeks where everyone kind of learned who he was. He had two touchdowns one week. But in terms of the scope of the season, you know, he was fine. Basically did exactly what you would expect out of a fourth-round safety Made a few plays, but also not very consistent in coverage and has a long way to go before I'm ready to say this guy's a stud safety, but the upside is there. So it's a sound secondary, you know, it's fine. Kyle Fuller and Adrian Amos could take another step up. I think they're probably pretty close to their ceiling, but we'll see. And then the depth pretty bad here. Marcus Cooper, frankly, a little surprised he's still on this team. Craven LeBlanc at safety slash corner, DeAndre Hall, Deion Bush. So if you do suffer any injuries here, they're pretty screwed. <laughs> it's a pretty thin secondary in my opinion. Really pretty thin, honestly, across this entire defense outside of middle linebacker. So as we look at the teams overall here, they're gonna come in tied for 27th on defense. So I do think this defense is gonna hold this team back in a lot of games, especially that inability to get after quarterbacks, you know, Kirk Cousins. Matthew Stafford, Aaron Rodgers in this division. You know, these guys are going to dice this defense up if they're not getting after the quarterback. And with a young offense, it's going to be pretty difficult for me to say they can keep pace. I do have this team ranking pretty high, actually, for coaching culture. I've always thought the Bears have a very good culture throughout all of these coaching changes. They always play tough. You know, they play in a lot of close games. That's always a good sign that players understand their role and, you know, they want to win, which is obviously important. I believe in Matt Nagy as a coach that's going to come in, maybe not do quite what Sean McVay was able to do for the Rams, but something like that. It's obviously the common comparison, the recency bias bringing that opinion in here. So something along those lines. So now let's wrap this up, take a look at the schedule and talk about what this all means. And as you would expect, an NFC schedule, very grueling. Really no easy stretches. They do get Tampa Bay at home, New York Jets at home. So those will probably be wins. But you got to start at Green Bay against Seattle. I actually gave them a win against Seattle. That's not an easy win to give them by any means. Most of their road games are pretty tough. I did give them a win in Miami. They got to go to Buffalo. Could certainly win that, but it's very difficult to win in Buffalo against that defense. 
So Vegas has them at six and a half wins. And uh, the first time here on these deep dives, I'm just saying don't bet, period. There's some bets that I like better than others. Right now, my favorites are the under on Cleveland and Tampa Bay. But at six and a half, you can see I've actually got them winning seven games, but that's pretty optimistic, giving them the Rams and Minnesota at home. Definitely not locks there. Those could both easily be losses. So while I'm gonna project over on this, their win range actually comes out below the over under. So again, this is a case where I like this Bears team. They're headed in the right direction. If Trubisky's a franchise quarterback, maybe in a year, they'll be ready to compete with some of these NFC teams. But man, the NFC is a freaking gauntlet. And if you can look at this schedule and say that you see 10 wins, 11 wins, what it's gonna take to get into the playoffs, maybe even 12, then more power to you, man. But I cannot do that right now. So that's gonna do it, Bears fans. Let me know how hyped you are for this season, what your expectations are. If you're not a Bears fan, what do you think of this prediction here? Five to seven wins for this much improved Bears team. So I hope you guys enjoyed. Do like the video if you did. It helps me out more than you know. Cheers as always. We'll see you next time.